Hello and welcome to our keynote presentation and discussion with Diane Wilson, Seeds and Stories. I'm Janine Shevert and I will be your host for this session. Thank you to Humanities Iowa and Terra Chips for sponsoring this session. <clears throat> Terra Chips donated money that made creating this beautiful platform possible. And Humanities Iowa money specifically made it possible to offer tickets at the $20 level, making this conference so much more accessible to many. Before we get started, let me draw you your attention to our community agreements. By being here, we agree to be respectful, be curious, be patient, to speak from our own experiences, trying to avoid jargon, be conscious of intent versus impact, take space if you are someone who does not speak up often, and make space for others if you are someone who is used to speaking. And lastly, remember to take care of yourself. And with that, let me bring Diane Wilson to the stage. Welcome, Diane. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Hamitakiapi, uh, Diane Wilson, Amakiapia, Bede Wakantuan Oyate, Hamatahaya, Sichangu Oyate, Ed Omawapia. Hello, all my relatives. My name is Diane Wilson, and I am a descendant of the Bede Wakantuan Oyate in Minnesota, and I'm enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. So bear with me for just a second here where I make a uh, technical move. Um, I've been practicing, so with luck, all goes well. All right. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so I just want to say that I am so honored to be invited here for the Seed Savers Conference. Um, this is just a, a, one of the organizations that I believe is doing such incredibly important work and has been for so many years to protect seeds and promote biodiversity. And so I want to thank Seed Savers and, and um, Janine Shefford for the invitation to be here and for all the hard work that everyone has put into hosting this conference. But I would especially like to applaud the efforts of all the gardeners and the seed keepers who are here today, who are sharing this work in their own gardens. So in my life and work, I've always said that I'm a gardener and a writer, which means I take care of seeds and stories. I believe that seeds carry the history and stories of the world we live in, while our stories carry seeds for the future we hope to create. As Thomas King has written, the truth about stories is that that's all we are. As a Dakota writer, I'm descended from people who were and continue to be oral storytellers. Dakota writer Teresa Peterson explained in her book, Voices from Pejut Azizi, that the Dakota told two kinds of stories. The Wicho Oyake contain a people's history, migrations, and genealogy, while Hitunkankapi are myths and legends. The role of the storyteller was to remember and pass down stories that preserve our history and culture, that teach values and lessons, and also entertain. So I think of my own work as written stories that also preserve history and culture, while reflecting on our contemporary experience of assimilation, especially with regard to the teachings embedded in our traditional stories. At the heart of my writing is a commitment to cultural recovery that was inspired by Dakota historian David Larson, who said, when you know what was taken away, then you can reclaim it. I first began learning from seeds in year 2000 while I was working on a memoir, Spirit Car, about my mother's family. I heard about a collection of rare indigenous seeds that were being grown out by a tiny bare bones native program called Dream of Wild Health. As an avid gardener, I knew immediately that I needed to be with these seeds, that they were calling me to this work. As a writer, I was fascinated by the stories these seeds were carrying. 
800-year-old traditional tobacco, Cherokee Trail of Tears corn, and Hopi black turtle beans. These seeds carried stories of the seasons, of the ancestors who grew them, and the ancient wisdom of the mother plant herself. What I didn't know then was the long history these seeds carried, how close they had come to extinction, nor the important role played by women who had ensured their survival despite immense challenges. When I started working on The Seed Keeper, I knew that I wanted to share the story of Corn and how her survival has been entwined with the survival of human beings for thousands of years. Our ancestral memories and stories tell us that human beings once held an original agreement with seeds where we agreed to take care of each other. Imagine 9,000 years ago, at a time when humans and plants and animals could still speak to each other, a wild plant allowed herself to become domesticated into maize or corn. These early gardeners named this plant Teosintes, which translates to mean creator plus maize, reaffirming the sacred nature of the relationship between human beings and plants. Given the widespread practice of native people traveling long distances to trade with other tribes, maize eventually found its way to the Midwest. There's evidence of indigenous people in the present state of Illinois raising corn, beans, and squash by 1000 BC. Many of the tribes who began growing maize have stories that tell how corn first came to them as well as ceremonies, songs, and prayers to honor her gift of food. For people who knew too well what it meant to be hungry when game was scarce, maize offered the gift of survival. Over many generations, indigenous people of the Americas would develop three-fifths of the world's foods, including maize, potatoes, tomatoes, squash, beans, chocolate, and sunflowers, to name a few. They also accumulated a vast knowledge of plant properties that became the basis for modern pharmacology. Indigenous peoples held detailed traditional knowledge about how to live in balance with the natural laws of a particular place. Tewa educator Greg Kayeti calls this sacred science, knowing, remembering, practicing, and implementing place-based natural laws, which consist of practical knowledge for survival, such as knowing where to find water, the seasonal cycles of plants and medicines, and understanding the animals who provide our food. Before settlers arrived, much of the southern half of Minnesota, and much of Iowa as well, was covered with millions of acres of incredibly rich, diverse tall grass prairie, a vast landscape with deep topsoil that supported over 200 species of plants, birds, insects, and animals. This was the homeland for the Dakota, who were nomadic hunters, skilled gardeners, and wild food gatherers. Throughout the year, they moved around the region following the seasonal availability of their food. Corn became one of the foods that the Dakota relied on as part of their seasonal food cycles. In the early 1800s, more bands were growing corn as a supplement to hunting and gathering. The corn was planted when the strawberries were ripe, often near wild artichokes that indicated the soil was fertile. Much of the corn was eaten fresh, while some was dried and stored in bark containers that were buried. In Dakota, we say mitakuye owasi, which means we are all related. One of the most important teachings for Dakota people was to be a good relative. Our kinship rules were tribal law. That meant being a good relative to each other and to all beings around us by demonstrating and honoring reciprocity in caring for each other. 
When we take care of our seeds by providing healthy soil and water, for example, not only do they feed us, they also reconnect us with our own stories, with our ancestors, and they teach us the language of corn and beans and squash. Reciprocity honors our original agreement with seeds. The other story I was interested in telling as part of the Seed Keeper was how our relationship with seeds has changed. When European settlers arrived in Minnesota in the 1800s, they brought with them a very different relationship with the land. The clash between cultures that began in 1492 was as much about our drastically different food systems as it was about our differing values, languages, and spirituality. Where indigenous cultures were centered in community-based kinship, settlers introduced a worldview that regarded land as a commodity that could be bought and sold. Through nearly 400 treaties, tribes across the country were dispossessed of land they had lived on for thousands of years. In exchange, tribes received payment and annuity goods that undermined the seeds and foods that were central to indigenous culture. In place of a traditional diet based on local foods, they were moved onto reservations and given commodity foods that were high in starch and fat. As tribes became dependent on government rations, passing on traditional food knowledge and practices became more and more difficult as fewer families continued to garden. Boarding schools broke families apart and children were taught a new relationship with plants and animals. Seeds that had survived for thousands of years nearly vanished. As for the tall grass prairie that was once one of the largest ecosystems in the country, between 1830 and 1890, an estimated 70 million acres were plowed under to make way for farms with less than 1% remaining today. This diverse ecosystem and Dakota homeland was replaced with an agriculture system that would come to rely on growing limited crops, chemical fertilizers and pesticides, and genetically modified seeds. No longer were seeds, plants, animals, and water regarded as relatives, <clears throat> excuse me, to be cared for as taught in our traditional stories. This new agricultural system brought a profound shift toward treating the earth and the foods she provides as commodities. If our ultimate goal is to make money at all costs, then we can rationalize an agricultural system that was built on the backs of slaves and migrant workers that embedded racism within the heart of our food system. How our communities eat and how our food is grown is intimately connected to the environmental and civil rights issues we face. The food choices we make create the world we live in. So how do we reclaim a relationship with seeds and our food that is based in indigenous principles of kinship and reciprocity? We know that our ancestors protected these seeds at all cost because they, like our children, are the future. And yet our seeds are currently facing a climate crisis and mass extinction. But if we look beyond the news headlines, then I believe we will see instead that we are facing a crisis of relationship where the community of care created through upholding Mitakuye Owasi has been dismantled and disregarded for the sake of profit. When we open our hearts to relationship with other beings, then we're also opening our hearts to grief for the loss of so many exquisitely beautiful, tender lives that have been sacrificed for our convenience. How do we respond to such grief? What actions can we take when the issues we face are global in their immensity? How can one person or one community make a difference? 
These are the questions I struggle with each day. But when I step outside my front door and see corn sprouting in my garden or a baby snapping turtle on my driveway, then I remember my responsibility for the relatives who are still here. I also remember my responsibility as a Dakota grandmother to teach my children and grandchildren to be good relatives and to live each day believing that our actions will make a difference. Even if the world comes to an end tomorrow, we must still plant our seeds today. As I was writing the novel, it was important to me that this story remain hopeful despite all the challenges we're facing. I found inspiration in the stories of families who have held onto their seeds for generations and continued to garden, as well as organizations working to return these seeds to community. Some of these old seeds eventually made their way to Dream a Wild Health through a gift from a Potawatomi gardener, Cor Baker, who donated her lifetime collection of seeds to the farm. She sent the seeds with a letter saying that she had prayed and prayed that Indian people would start gardening again. Cora knew that one of the most important ways we rebuild the health of our communities is by returning to gardening and our traditional foods. Her gift of seeds allowed a new generation to learn how to garden and care for them once again. This is the work of reclaiming food sovereignty. Indigenous communities relearning how to grow, cook, and feed their families with healthy, culturally appropriate foods. Today, the tiny garden where I first volunteered to work with seeds has grown into a successful Native-led organization. From leasing a half-acre garden, Dream a Wild Health now owns a 30-acre organic farm in Hugo, Minnesota. At the heart of their work is a belief that we are healing ourselves, our ancestors, and our future generations when we return to our traditional foods. Looking back, my real education began at Dream a Wild Health, reclaiming the teachings that would one day allow me to write The Seed Keeper. We began each morning in a circle near the fields, all of us coming together for prayer before beginning the work of the day. We smudged to cleanse our spirits and offered tobacco with prayers of gratitude to the plants, soil, water, birds, and animals who shared this farm with us. And in this way, we learned that when we garden with reverence, when we honor and protect our seeds, then our food truly becomes our medicine. So I've been blessed in my life to work with two Native organizations who are protecting our seeds, including the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, or NAFSA, a national network that is working to rebuild sovereign food systems. One of NAFSA's best known programs is the Indigenous Seed Keepers Network, led by Rowan White, whom I know is very familiar to seed savers, which was established to nurture and support the growing seed sovereignty movement across the country. Dream of Wild Health and the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance both provide models for creating food systems and reclaiming food sovereignty that are built on a foundation of justice and equity, which is essential to a spiritually centered earth relationship. They are led by indigenous women and center a kinship worldview within their work. And as we all know, sharing seeds is a great way to build relationships between communities. We can also protect our seeds by sharing stories that nourish us, stories that educate, empower, and uplift our communities. In 2021, I published my novel, The Seed Keeper, that shares the struggle of Dakota women to protect their seeds and traditional way of life. In many ways, writing this book is my way to give back 
to the people who have shared so much with me and to help carry this work forward to future generations. The book was inspired by a true story that had been silenced for many generations. In 2002, I participated in the first ever Dakota Commemorative March to honor the 1,700 Dakota women, children, and elders who were forcibly removed from Minnesota after the 1862 war. Because the women had no idea where they were being sent or how they would feed their families, they sowed their seeds into the hems of their skirts and hid them in their pockets. Even when families were starving, these women protected their seeds for the coming season and for future generations. Thanks to their courage and sacrifice, we still have Dakota corn to grow today. Their actions offer a profound lesson in how to protect our seeds for future generations. The seed keeper is told through the voices of four Dakota women across several generations from 1862 to 2002. The question I ask throughout the book is about the ways in which our relationship with seeds has changed over many generations and what that change means for us as human beings and for the seeds themselves. Ultimately, the seed keeper is a story about protecting what we love, remembering our history, and celebrating the gifts we've received from our ancestors and the earth. Um, I wanna read you one paragraph from the book that sums up um, really how I think about seeds. And this is, this is um, at a time when the main character, Rosalie Ironwing, was just learning how to garden and learning to reconnect um, with the seeds. And so this is uh, just one paragraph. Everywhere I looked, I saw how seeds were holding the world together. They planted forests, covered meadows with wildflowers, sprouted in the cracks of sidewalks, or lay dormant until the long-awaited moment came, signaled by fire or rain or warmth. They filled the produce aisle in grocery stores. Seeds breathed and spoke in a language all their own. Each one was a miniature time capsule, capturing years of stories in its tender flesh. How ignorant I felt compared to the brilliance contained in a single seed. I had begun to see that when we save these seeds, when we select which ones will be planted again, our lives become braided into the life stories of these plants. So as you leave here today, I hope that you'll carry this message with you, that regardless of where you find yourself in your life or the headlines that you'll read in the morning, remember that even small efforts like saving our seeds and planting a garden can help create the world we envision for our families and our communities. And when we do this work, then we're reclaiming a healthy, sustainable relationship with the land. We're remembering our food, not as a commodity, but as medicine. We are protecting what we love and we're becoming the ancestors that future generations will need. Pidamaya. Thank you, Diane. Such beautiful and important words. Our Seed Savers Exchange Book Club recently read your 2021 novel, The Seed Keeper, and we're so excited that we get to talk to you today. Um, your book and your presentation today both open with this idea of knowing that our survival depends on knowing how to be a good relative. Mm -hmm. Seeds are so often used as metaphors, but even in a literal sense, they carry the future and they have much to teach us. I'm struck by how these stories of humans and the stories of seeds are often one story. We live together and grow together and take care of one another. Can you talk a little bit more about what humans today have to learn from seeds 
And also, is there anything you think seeds can learn from us? Hmm. Hmm. Um, well, my hope in writing the book the way that I did um, was to make us aware again of being in relationship as opposed to seeing seeds and everything else around us as something that we have been given the right to dominate, to um, treat in any way that we choose according to principles that apply primarily to a business mindset. So if something is, um, if something is effective in terms of a bottom line or making profit, then that's an acceptable rationale for proceeding in a certain direction. And one of the things that I really hoped as a writer in telling a story is that we would understand that that is a, a specific worldview that, that brings um, a specific set of values with it in the way that we treat other, um, other beings. And my hope is that we open up our minds and especially our hearts to a worldview that sees everyone around us as a relative. And I mean everyone, you know, the water, the soil, the air, um, our seeds, animals, each other human beings, because once we allow in that kind of um, oppressive thinking that we have the right as human beings to dominate another species, there's really no end to it. There's no end to the ways in which that kind of oppressive thought can be applied to every other being on the planet, including other human beings. And we see that playing out all over the all over the world so my hope that that as human beings we learn to live in relationship again um, which i think is that unique gift that seeds have to give us because they've allowed themselves to become domesticated and as far as what the seeds can learn from us um you know, I just hope that they learn that human beings sometimes get off track, but that we are teachable. We are, you know, that there is always hope, even as we see the, the earth continuing to spiral into this crisis. To me, there is always hope when we pick up that relationship again, when we, met, when we remember that we have this sacred responsibility um, as a, as a citizen of the earth to take care of the relatives around us. I love that. Thank you. Um, I believe wholeheartedly in storytelling's ability to change the world. And yeah. I think this book is a really good example of that. And what you were just describing um, kind of shares that view as well. What do you think it is about art and storytelling that can change the world and open people's minds in a mm. new way? I have a theory. <laughs> From many years of working as a writer and, you know, and um, just being in the arts community, that the advantage of art, that the unique gift that art has in conveying a difficult story is that it comes in through our imagination. So that, you know, the way, you, you know how you feel after you've read the headlines about mm -hmm. the glaciers melting, um, the tipping point, all the, all the terrible news that we are faced with every day. There's a way in which you almost have to protect yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Otherwise you can give in to despair. But when I can read a story in which I'm, it comes in through my imagination, and I ha and it gives me an ability to process it, and it also takes me to a place, and gives me some, hopefully, some storytelling tools that show me something new, that teach me a different way to be, or introduce ideas, or ask questions that maybe I haven't thought about. Then that, to me, is the gift of what art brings to this discussion. Because, you know, one of the things I was really 
paying attention while I was working in food sovereignty was how much that discussion around seeds and specifically uh, genetically modified organisms had really just been narrowed down to dueling science. So you'd have one set of data over here saying one thing, you'd have another set of data over here saying another thing, but no one was really raising that question about is, you know, there are ethical questions in this process that we need to think about because the implications affect us as human beings just as much when we are the ones that, that allow life in those seeds to be taken apart and then rebuilt with other species or, or altered in ways that, you know, maybe become um, tolerant to a chemical, but at what trade-off? So this is the um, this is what this is what I have been thinking about a lot is and why I chose fiction to to bring this story into um, into a reader's imagination first and foremost, and hopefully then to touch their hearts while off also offering a perspective that um, might introduce new questions. Yeah. Um, that makes me think about, I felt like you didn't make anyone in your book a villain. And yeah. I felt like you gave complexity and nuance and grace to each character. I'm curious if there were perspectives and characters that were harder to write because they felt further away or, or harder to, to find. Well, John, John mm -hmm. um, Rosalie's husband, who is a farmer, was um, probably the hardest character to write because he was the most different from me, not you know in all kinds of ways. But it was really important to me that um, farmers not be vilified. You know, we have a really complex history between native people and settlers and what happened around land and the dispossession. And that's an ongoing um, discussion about that history and what's and how that plays out today. But there's also a way in which the farmers who were then um, became the new caretakers of some of that land, how they lived on that land in a way that also took care of it. That, yeah. that you know, living with, um, with animals who then brought the manure back to the, to the fields and making sure that it was sustainable and that it was intended to take care of your families. And that what happened after World War II when um, chemical com companies got involved and really shifted farming from families to corporations and created this entirely new um, system of farming, that also impacted farmers hugely. And so what, what I'm hoping to um, continue to look at is where are the commons between all of us? Because seed work is so immense um, and the, 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 um, the responsibility we carry, not only for seeds, but for water and soil and everything else around us is so immense that it takes all of us. So I'm really interested in finding the commons between um, all of us who are taking care of seeds and foods. Yeah. Um, you've touched on this a little bit, but uh, so you're now uh, an award-winning author, and I've talked to people who have felt their life was changed by reading your book. Um, it invited them to think of seeds differently than they had before. Um, but even before you wrote The Seed Keeper, you were working for change in the realm of food justice and food sovereignty uh, through your work of dream with Dream of Wild Health and NAPSA and ISKN. How did these roles of artist and organizational leader overlap for you? And how does one feed the other? Well, it was, it was um, not easy, <laughs> I'll say that, but it was so gratifying to, um, in a way to, as I juggled those two roles, I could, I could be in community, um, to see these food programs and to see the impact of, of this history 
directly in community. And then as we were all learning together how to bring these seeds back and how to and just how to grow them and cook cook with them and bring the skills back at the same time and then work with youth around this. I could see it. I could see it um, myself in community, what was happening. And then I could take that back into my writing and process it and think about it. And then sometimes come to a different understanding and then bring that back into my work um, in organizations. So it was, I could not have written this book unless I put in all that time in those two organizations mm -hmm. and also as a volunteer with the seeds. It's like that was my, my apprenticeship to this book was to be in community, to work with elders and youth and farmers and the seeds themselves and really understand that there is a different way to be in the world than what I grew up um, as in Minneapolis, grew up knowing and, and learning in schools. So, um, you know, it was, it was a lot of work, but it ultimately gave me the gift of bringing able, being able to write this book. Oh, nice. Um, in this book, there are beautifully strong women at the center of the story, women who stand their ground, women who speak up and speak their truths. In my own experience, it can be a delicate balance between speaking the truth and using words that others have the ability to hear. Uh -huh. and admittedly, I can find it difficult. I'm wondering where you see yourself in these terms and also what role you'd like to see other seed keepers and seed savers um, in preserving the past and creating change for the better? Well, I, I really, you know, in, in actually in creating the two characters of Rosalie and Gabby. So for those of you who may not have read the book, Rosalie is very much a quiet, reserved, um, almost passive personality. Her friend Gabby is the opposite, and they both grew up under very difficult circumstances. Rosalie becomes a gardener. Gabby goes off to become a um, kind of a hell-raising activist and lawyer. And what I was trying to show with those two characters is that they all they both contribute. They both have gifts that they bring to this work. Um, that are based on who they are and, and what they know about themselves and, and what they can do. And they both come at cost. So, you know, there's impacts on your family, there's impacts on yourself based on the path that you choose. But if you stay with it, then there are also the, the rewards that come with those paths. And it's always tricky to find that balance between activism and, and also taking care of yourself so that you're not being um, traumatized or re-traumatized in doing the work. So um, I have to say some of the uh, Gabby's character was, was based on some of the Gabby's I've known who are really something about the name, really strong women, outspoken. Um, and I admire them so much for the work that they do. But I also admire the work of the gardeners and the seed keepers and the people who are not able to do that work, but instead are in their gardens every day taking care of the seeds themselves. So, so one of the ways we always talked about this at Dream of Wild Health was that we're all working in this big circle and every one of us is part of that work and bringing our gifts to the work and that sometimes you change places in the circle. So that for a while, for example, I was the executive director at Dream of Wild Health. And then um, when I retired from that work, I'm now back to being a volunteer. <laughs> so I've moved in the circle from volunteer to director back to volunteer. So now it's my joy to go and weed again mm -hmm. at, um, in the gardens. And so I'm a firm believer in bring your gifts and to the work and then you know and then and that's how we create a really strong circle I like that um as seed keepers and seed savers we often talk about seed selection choosing which seeds to save and plant for the next years and which to eat for sustenance this year mm -hmm. 
-hmm. I've been thinking about how we as humans also choose which stories to nurture and carry forward. The story that you tell in The Seed Keeper is at the same time beautiful, resilient, and inspiring, and it's also difficult and heartbreaking. As you described, it brings to life stories that are sometimes erased from the mainstream dialogue, including children being removed from their families, people from their way of life, and the effects of generations of forced assimilation. Why is it important to tell these difficult stories, and what do you think it is about seeds that can offer a beginning to healing this kind of trauma? Uh, I think that one of the consequences of holding traumatic stories or painful stories is that sometimes they get um, they get silenced to the extent that that people grow up not knowing who they are, and that's one of the consequences of assimilation and historical trauma. That earlier generations, especially those impacted by um, removal of children from their families and the boarding schools, that you see um, generations who were silenced because it was too dangerous to say who you were. Um, and sometimes it was too painful, that sometimes these are stories that they just, they couldn't bear to relive again. So, so then maybe it's the next generation that comes along. Um, so my mother uh, and aunts grew up in boarding school out in South Dakota, but they didn't like to talk about it. And so it became then my generation um, and my the work that I chose for myself to tell those stories. So through a memoir, through a, um, interviews with elders in a, a book I wrote called Beloved Child, and then in this novel was a way to give voice to silent stories. And I feel like for myself, that is the work that I've chosen to do. And that by sharing those stories, um, it allows people to reconnect with their own history and their own culture. And it can, it can, um, it can do the work of cu cultural recovery. And so I feel like there's a lot of healing that can happen when we tell these stories. And, that's, and part of that is removing the shame of having been part of a history that you may not have had any control over, or you may not even have known about because it might have been an earlier generation, but that trauma lives on in your family. So we tell these stories, we, um, you know, we raise up this history that we have been part of, whether we knew it or not. And then that gives us a platform for beginning to actually work with it hopefully resolve some of the, the trauma embedded in it. And one, one of the, one of the um, reasons why I have so appreciated seed work and food work was to see how seeds and food bring people together. And it's joyful work because we all love a good meal, right? <laughs> we love being in the garden and I got to see youth who came up from um, the cities who sometimes came from very difficult family circumstances. And I saw them transform in the garden. Mm -hmm. I saw how they could, they could be children again. They could feel safe and they could begin to um, learn self-confidence and go out and become leaders in their communities. And that was part of what the seeds and being in the garden gave back to them. So I'm a firm believer in, in the possibility and the potential of working with seeds as a healing path for all of us. Yeah, I like that. Um, I have one more question for you here and then we'll turn to questions for the audience from the audience. Um, so if you're in the audience and have questions, please enter them into the chat and we will get those asked as well. Um, there are a couple of places in the story where Rosalie is called by seeds in one way or another. In fact, I believe that Aunt Darlene has says she's planted corn in buckets in her apartment so that Rosalie could find her, which I love. Um, Rosalie in this story has grown up without a family or connection to culture um, and without a connection to the seeds. So this calling is part of a pathway home for her. You talked a little bit in your presentation about how you were also called by seeds when you first started to look into your Dakota family history. 
I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about this and also how do we listen for that call if we're looking for something like that in our lives? Mm. You know, um, I, what I remember is just hearing from someone about these old seeds that were being grown on a little half acre garden. And it was one of those moments. It's like, oh, I got to go there. <laughs> I've got to go be with those seeds. And, you know, not thinking too deeply about it other than it was fascinating to me that just hearing the stories and then knowing that these seeds had been passed along through generations of Native families. And it, it was just that. It was like, oh, I got to go be part of that. <laughs> and then, you know, started volunteering and one thing leads to another. And then the next thing you know, you're working there and then, you know, the director and then you're the back to a volunteer again. <laughs> so the, the calling, I think, comes when you're just when you're when you're exploring the questions in your life and you're listening, you know, and you're taking the time to pay attention to what's coming to you in that process. And. And so that, because that was all part of the time when I was working on the memoir about my mother's family and trying to understand boarding schools and assimilation and everything. And then here come the seeds. And, and then to look back 20 years later and to see, well, there was a whole group of us who showed up at about that time. And mm -hmm. to me, that was the seeds calling. That was them saying, we're coming out now, we're coming back and we need you and you and you to show up and be part of this work. And then, you know, because now to think that back then, only 20 years, <clears throat> that little tiny garden with basically handfuls of seeds and a couple of shovels and people who are just passionate about it is now a 30 acre farm, 30 yeah. acre organic farm that is a model for doing this work in the country is, pretty that's to, that's a miracle Impressive. and the seeds yeah. to me the seeds brought in what they needed when they needed it when they were ready and i think that happens for all of us when we're paying attention when we're listening i know women who are deep in um water work you know they they do the walks they do the protection they sing the songs there are other people who do other things so you listen for your what calls you what what is what's your pathway and, you know, I'm guessing that for this particular audience, that there's a lot who feel called by seeds and gardening and, you know, all of this, all this beautiful food work. And I feel like we're all so blessed to be doing this work together. Absolutely. I have a question here from Mel Trueblood Stimson. Mel is asking, do you have any suggestions for indigenous people that want to be authors but have no idea where to start? Yes, <laughs> I do. Um, and I thank you so much for asking that question because um, that's one of the that's one of the other areas that I feel very strongly about seeds and stories. And so if you are um, wanting to start writing, um, you s get a notebook and a pen and start writing. I mean, that seems very simplistic, but that's basically where it starts. And you, you don't have to start anywhere in particular, but if you have a story that you wanna tell, just start writing it down anywhere, in the middle, at the end, the beginning, just start writing it down and then get connected or create your own writing group so that you hold each other accountable. Um, start looking at the books that you're reading and and look at them in terms of well how did that writer do it how did they you know create their chapters how did they um, what's the rhythm of their words and and more than anything mel just believe in your ability to tell this story that whatever it is you are the right person um, to tell that story and it's a long it's a it's a practice like any other discipline but um just I, I, I heartily encourage you to just start writing and, and dive in. Great, thank you. And thank you, Mel. 
Um, Elizabeth is saying, I perpetually feel that I'm falling short in my duty of care to the plant kin in my life. Do you have any guidance about how to approach this? Oh, God, there are days when there are deer and rabbits and voles and owls and, you know, and and you just sometimes wonder, well, how, you know, how did our ancestors survive? How did they actually feed themselves when some days I can barely, you know, squeak a salad out when I look at how much I've shared with everyone around me? So, um Elizabeth, I'm not sure I have the answer to that other than to do the best you can. And I firmly believe in um, offering those prayers of gratitude to the plants and then just give them that care, the care that, you know, they need and that you can give as a gardener and then just forgive yourself where it falls short. I believe we're all a community of learners, right? We're all on that path of learning how to do this again. And so it doesn't help to um, judge ourselves or be critical of what didn't work, but just keep trying, you know, just keep learning and trying and, you know, find joy in it too. Yeah. I feel like it kind of circles back to what you said before too about using your gifts and and yeah. knowing, knowing what you have to give. Yeah, right. And sometimes, you know, plants aren't happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've all seen and they want to go somewhere else. They don't like this spot. They want to move over there. And, right. you know, so learning to pay attention to what a plant is telling you, you know, that's a lifetime of work right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, please feel free to add any more questions if you have any in the comments, uh, in the chat. Um, Diane, there's a lot of people just feeling really good about hearing your words. So thank oh, you. Oh, good. For all of yeah. This. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm happy to answer, um, yeah. you know, anything. Well, I have another question. Um, so one of the things that uh, people ask me a lot in, in my work here is, um, especially in the last five years, I would say people wanting to connect to their cultural origins through seeds and asking for um, any knowledge that we have or any seeds that we have that uh, come from the same communities that they're coming from. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about um, your thoughts about this. I know not everyone knows that or not everyone um, necessarily has that ability to learn about seeds uh, within their family necessarily. Yeah. Um, in, your, in your book, Rosalie, I think is connected to seeds of her ancestors, but also seeds that she doesn't have that same cultural connection to. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about seeds belonging to groups of people and how that can be shared or, or should or shouldn't be shared? Well, so I, when I talk about indigenous seeds, I'm talking about heirloom seeds that have been part of a family or native community for generations. And then because of what happened um, through the reservation system and commodity foods, then a lot of those foods were displaced and the seeds were either lost or became close to extinct. And so the work that we have been doing um, in food sovereignty is about returning those seeds specifically to native communities and native families first, so that making sure that they have access to foods that are, were part of their heritage. But at the same time, this is work that, you know, you think of all, I mean, think of what's in the, um, the seed archives at Seed Savers in terms of heirloom seeds from all over. And that, that to do a little exploration to see if you can find, if there are seeds that somehow resonate with your own family history, your own story, where you know that um, your people came from, where your indigenous roots are, you know, they can be around the, the globe. And, and then see, and see if you can make a relationship that way. But if you can't, and this was a, this was a big question for me, 
um, in working with seeds that we had very little knowledge about. So I, I talked to an elder and, the, and I, she gave me some advice that I thought was really good. So let's say you find a tomato in Seed Savers Archive that grows really well for you. Maybe it's, it doesn't have any family connection that, or, or his, history that you're aware of. But if you grow that plant for seven years, then that seed belongs to you. That mm -hmm. seed has become acclimated to your land, to your hands, to your family, and that this is a seed that you can now claim as part of your, um, your family seed bundle. And that, and what she told us was that at the end of those seven years, you can do, um, you can, you can name that seed, which, you know, naming in native culture is a, is a very significant process to, mm. so, but, but to have that sense of you can build, you can reclaim relationships with a seed mm. that doesn't directly have a connection to your family now, but you give it that connection over seven mm -hmm. years and beyond. And then that seed knows you and you know that seed. Nice, I like that. Um, speaking of connections um, and, and your work overall, can you give us your definition of food justice and food sovereignty? So the um, food sovereignty, the kind of the, the conventional, the, the definition that I worked with a lot was, you know, healthy, affordable, culturally appropriate foods for a community. Um, and that you are able to really own your own food systems and produce those foods for your own community. So that idea that you're really only sovereign if you can feed yourselves, which mm -hmm. isn't that a huge, I think about that daily as, you know, I'm nowhere near that in my own garden practice, but I do support other gardens, you know, through a CSA. So I like yeah. some flexibility in how we interpret that. Yes. <laughs> food sovereignty for communities means you have the system set up to feed those culturally appropriate foods. And they're different depending on where, you know, your land base is, but you're able to bring those foods back to your community. Now, my personal interpretation of food sovereignty is real simple. It's healthy children, mm -hmm. you know, you have that, you have all the rest of it. So. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'll end with um, referring to the ending of your book where um, one of the characters has to decide what to do with these seeds that he's been given. And um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, many of <laughs> us have seeds that we are uh -huh. caring for. What kind of advice would you like to give all of us who are caring for seeds and, and thinking about what comes next. Um, so I just saw Indigenous Food Lab. Yes, <laughs> that's some good work happening. Um, so at the end of the book, there is a character, a young man who's, who's the son of Rosalie and her husband. Um, so he's mixed and he has grown up with that tension between two worldviews, what is conventional farming and then Rosalie's teachings from um, her own indigenous uh, values. And so here's Thomas who's given this, these very precious seeds and, and he's trusted with them. And he's at a crossroads where he has to decide what to do. Does he, does he um, take them to you know, the place where he's, he's interning, where they could be exploited, or does he take this other path that is more his mother's teachings? And so it's not resolved. And I have to say, I get asked so often <laughs> <laughs> in book clubs where people just want to know, what did he decide? <laughs> and so I have to say that I left him as the question that we're all facing every day that this decision of, especially the choices that we're making around our food every day and also about our seeds. You know, are we, are we purchasing 
them from a big box store where they could have been treated with neonicotinoids and that's a pesticide that's harmful to pollinators? Or do we, do we take that extra care, that extra uh, effort to buy our organic seeds and then save them? And then do we look at where our food is coming from and pay attention to what kind of system we're supporting through those purchases? And so it, Thomas is the character who is asking all of us to be aware every day about how our choices, those food choices, those seed choices, are creating this world that we're living in. And we're either supporting you know, a system that's based on kinship or we're, ba we're supporting a system that's based on profit. And not to beat anyone up around choices that you're making, but to start with awareness and then to see where can I shift? Where can I make changes? Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining this session. And Diane, thank you so much for sharing with us. Oh, I just want to say what a fan I am of Seed Savers and you know all of you coming to this conference to do this work. So thank you for the invitation, Pidamaya.